Cześć! Słuchacie podcastu Demagoga, pierwszej polskiej organizacji fact-checkingowej. Zapraszamy Was na rozmowę o dezinformacji, fact-checkingu i walce z fake newsami. Another day, another lie, another conspiracy theory, another falsehood. Czy Pan wie, co to jest profil fejkowy? Is fake news real? You are fake news. Nieprawda, nieprawda, nieprawda. Hello everyone, my name is Bart Pawlowski and I'm with Demagog Poland. Thank you for listening to our podcast. My very special guest today is Elliot Higgins, the founder of Bellingcat, a team of investigative journalists who rely primarily, if not exclusively, on open source intel on the internet. Um, hello Elliot. Hi, thanks for having me on. Thank you for agreeing to talk with us. Elliot, I wanted to say a few words about Bellingcat because I believe that not everyone in Poland knows what you do. Um, it's been seven years since the foundation of Bellingcat and uh, and there's a lot of work you've done over the years. Um, Bellingcat is responsible for a few very big journalist cases. Uh, they include the discovery of the truth behind the downing of MH17. A few days ago we had the seventh anniversary of that, exposing Assad's regime and their use of chemical weapons in Syria, identifying agents responsible for the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and Alexei Navalny, um, and many, many more. So that's a few words for the start. Obviously, you'll find plenty of links in the description of this episode. You can check them out. Um, it's all going to be there. Uh, we also highly recommend Elliot's book. Um, you can already buy it in Poland. There are a few copies that uh, we as Demagog are giving away. Um, check it out. I wanted to start with a basic question concerning the internet in general. Um, when Bellingcat started, I think you can say that almost everything was on the internet. People were not very careful with leaving trails behind. They would post stuff on social media. You know, Even people you would not normally consider likely to share so much from their lies, like high-level military operatives. But recently, over the past few years, there's been a trend of increasing the privacy and sort of also increasing the limit on what others can access on social media. Do you think that this will hamper in any way Bellingcat's work in the future? Well, I've kind of always approached it as what we had access to, say, five years ago, you know, from what people were sharing themselves and what um, social media platforms allowed you to access through their uh, APIs was, you know, I always thought of it as a kind of 130% of what we can expect to find. And we're moving towards kind of 100% more than we're going from like 100% to 70%. Um, as, as well, it's, it's because our work is focused so much on the kind of uh, Middle East and uh, Russia, Whilst you might see there's a certain kind of awareness of what's possible there and, you know, also in Europe through our reporting, in other parts of the world where they haven't really encountered this kind of investigation, they're less aware of what's possible. So it's always interesting for me when we kind of start writing about a topic in a new part of the world and the kind of government responds like saying, oh, this is fake news or these are all fakes. And we kind of are like, well, no, we, we've been through this before. We have a government saying that kind of thing. So we know exactly how this ends up. Good example of that is when we were looking into um, a, a video that showed executions of two women and two young children in Cameroon. And we made our initial publication and the Cameroonian government gave a press conference with their communications minister showing parts of the video with the words fake news under it, swearing that they weren't Cameroonian soldiers, the uniforms weren't the same, they were using the wrong weapons. And um, a year later, all those soldiers were convicted in a Cameroonian court based off the work that we had um, done. So, um, yeah, it, it's it, it might seem like there's a, it's it, it might seem like there's a contraction in some places, but in other places, they still really aren't aware of what's possible with this kind of work. Is that any different in countries in which the government's control over the internet is much stricter? You would think that Iran would be a place like that. You know, one of the reasons would be that they block signal. And it's harder to communicate with people who are over there. But it turned out last year, when the Ukrainian plane was shot down near Tehran, that didn't really stop you from going into that and discovering that it was the military that was behind it. Yeah, and um, in that case, what, what happens in kind of more um, closed countries where there's more kind of security risks to people sharing information online is information tends to get shared on closed social networks. 
Um, so kind of private WhatsApp groups, for example, or Telegram channels. And then um, people who are kind of following that who might be outside the country will then repost that information on an open network like Twitter or Facebook, which is often when it's kind of discovered. And it's possible to trace some of this back to the original point. Um, which is something you can do ideally with any piece of open source information. But the nature of the way that information is shared um, makes it more difficult. But it still means that stuff is discoverable. It just comes through a slightly less direct route than other material that you would find online. Going through all the cases that you've worked on, the MH17 case, the poisonings, many of the military stuff, you would think that people like that, that are you know high in the hierarchy, there's this fame of GRU and FSB, that they are really secretive. And you wouldn't really think that they leave stuff behind. They don't post much on social media, you know, like photos with their families, bragging that they, they are crossing the border, you know, bringing this weapon over, or that they use chemical weapons. Um, to me, it was really surprising when I realized that they behave like normal people, They are not that careful. Do you think that they are not careful because they are not competent in a way or they were not trained to do that or they are not aware that this was left behind them? Do you not think that in a way they use that to show off, you know, what they are doing and, you know, they want to show everyone, see, this is what we can do. This is what we do. And we want you to be scared of us. Well, I, th I think it's more that, you know, when, when we were working on um, Ukraine, which started with um, the downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 on July 17th in 2014, um, that then led us to find kind of more information about Russia's involvement in the conflict. And what we discovered there were young soldiers who were involved with going from Russia to Ukraine to fight as basically as part of the Russian military, but secretly, um, were freely posting stuff on social media because they're kind of young, you know, conscripts, young guys who just do that anyway. That's just the way they kind of think. So that led us to making lots of discoveries that otherwise would have been impossible thanks to the soldiers just sharing the old, own information. Alongside that, you also had local people in Russia and Ukraine filming and photographing uh, these kind of military vehicles and soldiers and in some cases that allowed us to connect one kind of military unit or one vehicle that we saw in ukraine back to russia and show that it had originated in russia which is in fact what we did with the um, missile launcher that shot down mh17 then you have kind of when we're looking into like the intelligence operatives you find there is less of that but there are still sometimes digital traces that makes them discoverable um, with the stuff we've been doing on the scripple poisoning and the navalny poisoning and these other assassinations in russia that combined kind of traditional open sources along with um, basically the black um, market for data in Russia. Um, in Russia, because the bureaucracy is corrupt from top to bottom, everyone's figuring out a way to make money from it. And one way that's done is um, selling information from government databases and police databases. And that's quite freely available online. Um, it includes things like passport registration documents, uh, detailed phone records, Um, you know, all kinds of information alongside leaked databases of things of like car registries and house registries. So you combine that information that is kind of being leaked with the open source material, and that can lead to, um, you know, more discovery. So in the case of the kind of Russian spy stuff, that's more down to Russia just being uh, just an inherently corrupt country. And this information that in other countries would be inaccessible to an ordinary member of the public, very accessible to people like myself and anyone else who knows where to look. Changing the topic slightly, uh, I wanted to compare the work you've done on Syria and uh, then on Skripal's poisoning. The essence of open source intelligence gathering is working away from the actual events. You addressed that a few times in your book, um, that you were sort of, I don't want to say detached, But, you know, watching the videos, chemical weapons used on civilians, all the suffering, cities being destroyed with artillery and stuff, you said that you would take an analytical approach and not really emotional. And so I wanted to ask if that changed at all uh, with the Scripple case. It was not that far away from Leicester, where you're originally from. Did that feel like the events came to you? Well, the Scripple case was a, um, a bit unusual because... We didn't start looking into that from the, like the day it was it happened because we didn't really have much to look into. 
It was only until the identities of the suspects were released a few months later and that the um, a Russian news site actually published a flight manifest from the flight that they were on that that gave us enough to investigate. So really, when we were investigating that, it was after, many months after the actual events had occurred. Um, so again, there wasn't that kind of emotional connection. And that's not kind of a very useful thing to have when you're trying to do an investigation, because especially if you're looking at horrible material, you've got to stay kind of as detached as possible. But that kind of uh, risk of trauma through seeing that imagery is something that you have to be very aware of in this line of work. And it's something that in our office and, you know, with our team that we talk about a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, just with the Scripple case, because it was, uh, you know, just that kind of big gap in time as well, I, I think it made it just, uh, you know, very different from, um, you know, something that happened in the moment. They were in England and it all happened there. Um, there was also the case in Czechia, you know, in Bulgaria, The war in Serbia, the war in Libya, they happened far away. And then you took on a lot more cases that took place in Europe. And although it was not a war per se, it was still pretty serious. And, you know, and after exposing the use of chemical weapons, the executions of prisoners, all the stuff that happened in Ukraine, did you ever feel like, um, maybe let me put that in different words, I read Bill Browder's Red Notice, and I remember very vividly that all the at the very end he speaks a lot about being on Vladimir Putin's hit list, and also you know is very concerned with his safety, which is obviously a fair thing to say considering what happened to Sergei Magnitsky. Um, but have you ever felt like you or a part of your team? because of what you do, might be exposed to something you wouldn't necessarily want to be exposed to? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's like it got to the point now where we have to be a lot more aware of our security, particularly those of us who have worked directly on the stuff related to the Russian assassination. So, for example, um, you know, I'm in regular contact with the British counterterrorism police about my own safety. Um, we've uh, my co colleagues, you know, they have to take their own precautions I mean, we have to be a lot more careful about. Um, you know, digital devices we have as well, because we get targeted by all sorts of hacking campaigns. We've um, got to be aware of our physical security. You know, like if I, um, you know, post uh, coronavirus, if I go to a hotel, I won't eat food in those hotels and I won't order room service just because I just can't trust now that, you know, knowing what we know about how they operate, that we can't just trust that they won't be, you know, something happening there. So um, we have to be a lot more cautious about um, what we do and uh, how we live. I also wanted to, to speak about it because uh, a few, I think it was, might have been a month or two months ago, me and my colleagues, you know, in, in Demagogue, so we are a fake news fact-checking organization, sort of like Snopes or, you know, or Pagella Politica. We are also a part of the a member of International Fact-Checking Network. And so we, we were being, or we were asked to, to do an interview for, I can't remember who that was, but basically about the safety of fact-checkers and sort of, you know, they would bring up cases of people that were threatened in, in Brazil, in Serbia, I think, well, like seriously threatened. And uh, to us, we didn't really feel like that because, yeah, we do receive many, many different messages, which are not nice and use very, very nasty words. But we never really felt like this was a serious thing. I mean, we, I don't think we still do. But uh, I, you know, seeing that it's, it's growing everywhere in the world and also, you know, understanding that investigative journalism and what Belinka does is way more serious than simple fact checking. Yeah, I, I, I thought that this would be interesting to, to see what the perspective of someone who was really at the top of the game. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, there's there's two main worries. There's the kind of state actors, you know, the kind of GRU and FSB and all the other Russians that we've uh, annoyed over the years. Um, and, and, and you also then have the kind of online communities who, you know, have grown um, around certain subjects and of, often find themselves in opposition to what we uh, work on. So, you know, around any topic, really, from MH17 to, you know, the conflict in Syria or the Russian assassinations, there's always some online community that has decided that, you know, you're the CIA or the devil or whoever it may be. And the problem with those communities, you tend to have individuals who, are, you know, just take things to the extreme. I mean, it's just the nature of the internet. There's so many people that they'll always kind of, you know, find the people who have the most extreme views about a subject and they'll be the 
loudest and most angriest at you on the internet and, uh, you know, fill your Twitter mentions up with all kinds of abuse. Now, you can ignore those people, but the problem is it's always a bit hard to know if, you know, one of those people is going to be the one who's crazy enough to turn up at one of your events and, you know, try to shoot you or stab you. So um, that's kind of the other kind of concern. And that's a bit harder to predict because, you know, at least with Russia, you know, if they do something against me, there, you know, is a consequences. But if it's just some crazy loner who wants to kind of kill a demon or, you know, CIA agent or whatever he imagines I am, then that is something that's a bit harder to protect against because, you know, the lone individual is probably more dangerous in one sense than a state. So as in it would be more difficult to protect yourself from the white supremacist type of people like from from 8chan or 8kun right now. The also thing, yeah, you also spoke about it a lot. If we're kind of at an event and we're speaking at a public event and anyone can attend, then, you know, anyone can attend. So, and certainly before the lockdown, um, I was doing more and more events where there was always like someone who was a bit weird in the audience who'd ask weird questions or like just be generally odd. And it was getting a bit more and more, more uh, worrying that it was happening more and more frequently. So I was kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm rather glad that, You know, if we promote this book, I've been able to do it over Zoom rather than do it in purpose, because who knows would have turned up at those ones. Bellingcat essentially brought a number of white supremacists to justice in the US you know, after the Charlottesville riots. Um, you also talked a lot about Aid Kun and QAnon and related stuff. Um, right now, there is a trial of four suspects in the MH17 case in the Netherlands. Um, do you think that this could be the case with them? Well, the suspects were directly involved. You know, I think the most serious thing was moving the missile launchers, the, the book, from Russia to Ukraine and then back. But in your book, you said that you were almost certain that the order to, to do that, to move the missiles, arms, weapons to Ukraine, came from the very top. So do you think the four suspects will be held responsible? You know, they will see some justice? Because I don't think you can presume you will be able to bring the justice to people who, who gave the orders. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, these, um, you know, the people who are on trial, whilst they're quite serious with it, as senior in the um, kind of uh, structure of the separatists, there are people, you know, th this was stuff that was being coordinated directly with the Russian military on a large scale. This just wasn't one missile launcher that was sent over in one day. This was months of support that included soldiers being sent over, tanks and artillery and other air support systems. Um, it included multiple cross-border artillery attacks. We, I mean, we counted over 100 sites where inside Russia where there'd been launches into um, Ukraine in just one summer in 2014. So this was a massive scale of military support coming from Russia. So that certainly wasn't happening without the knowledge of, you know, the leadership of Russia. I mean, it would be insane to think there was a large scale war effectively being fought with huge amounts of troop movements and the president would have been aware of it. So th that at that level, I think it's going to be a lot harder to bring, bring those people to justice. And that's unfortunately just the nature of kind of, you know, international politics that the most powerful people kind of get away with it. They get a finger whack at them by other political leaders but you know not much happens but i think for us what is really um one of the biggest things at the moment is this the um stuff we've been doing on the russian assassinations because it's becoming increasingly clear that whilst we might know you know the famous cases like skripal and Levani, there's many more cases of assassinations by the russian state of political opponents and critics And uh, also, you know, both at home and abroad. And this is something that's been going on for years on a very large scale. Um, and um, we're hoping we actually will be, um, I mean, we, we've got, for example, we've published about uh, multiple assassinations already. And we've still got a backlog of assassinations that we're working for because there's so many assassinations we have to investigate. Um, I mean, we've got, I think, five or six at the moment that we've got as a backlog. And we've published on about half a dozen already. So, um, yeah, I mean, the scale of this is quite large. And we think what we found is really just the tip of the iceberg, because what was surprising to us was it's not just major figures who are being targeted, like Navani and people like, um, you know, Sergei Skripal, but quite minor people as well. And in fact, people you might not have even heard of unless you were kind of you know, knew them personally, like really like local activists. And they've been targeted you know, for assassination, sometimes successfully. So the fact is that there may have been many people who died who just weren't didn't make it to the media and that we may never know about just because they were killed. And when there's this discussion about, um, you know, are, aren't the Russian intelligence services so incompetent because they keep getting caught? 
the only reason they got caught is because of the Scripple case. And before that, there were many, many more assassinations that they did and other activity that was never detected. So up until that point, they were doing fine. They were getting away with murder, literally. Um, and it was only because of the Scripple case and the mistakes that were made there and the basically the way the Russian kind of bureaucracy is so corrupt and allowed us to get access to files we wouldn't have access to in any other country that we could start kind of picking apart this entire network. Um, and, you know, that's what we're continue, continuing to do. So I think that is probably going to have more impact at this moment on the international opinion about Russia than the results of the MH17 case. Because we're, I think we already know that Russia is behind it. I don't think any reasonable person at this point is saying that, you know, Russia wasn't involved. Um, and if you've watched the court cases with the four suspects, you'll see there's masses of damning evidence, including, you know, intercepted phone calls between the suspects, you know, involved with the transport, all kinds of information that supports, um, you know, the case. Don't you ever get frustrated that after all the work that you've done, again, I'm going back to Syria because uh, I think this was one of the most dramatic ones, the use of chemical weapons on civilians, then blowing up the arms depot in Czechia and, and others. Um, there is usually some sort of international response, you know, on the diplomatic level. But it's always really hard to do something to prevent such things from happening again. One thing that you do is, you know, show that the people who are behind it, the criminals, uh, there is someone watching them. And uh, that is um, maybe not going to be forgotten, but this is going to be noticed. Um, we will know that you do it, uh, but it's hard to to sort of execute any any response, like something that would really, maybe maybe not hurt, but tell them that, you know, smack them on their, on their hands, can I say? When it comes to conflict, the, the issue with accountability is usually down to whether or not you've got someone at the UN Security Council who's got your back. And obviously Syria's got Russia, um, you know, supporting it. So it makes kind of accountability through that kind of mechanism very difficult. Um, the thing with open source evidence, though, and, you know, the way that we work is it offers a new way for, to kind of bring accountability because... It's now possible to give her evidence that, you know, 10 years ago would have been kind of unthinkable to even have access to video footage and other information. Um, and this is all being shared online. So a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment is working with um, international bodies and justice and accountability organizations on the question of how is this kind of evidence usable in places like the International Criminal Court or in national courts? You know, you've seen examples in France and Germany where um, Syrians are taking the Syrian government um, to court in those countries, thanks to the local laws that allow them to do so, where open source evidence is playing a big part in this. So a lot of the work we're doing at the moment is focusing on justice and accountability and the application of open source investigation and evidence. And we've developed a process which we have applied to Saudi airstrikes in Yemen of archiving and investigating incidents um, with the intention of that kind of research and then being shareable with um, kind of accountability bodies or with lawyers who might be trying to build a case. Um, and that's very important because what's happening more and more is, in a sense, the And kind of traditional human rights organizations, their position has kind of changed slightly because now you, the kind of organizations like Bellingcat, who are the, almost like the frontline responders to this information being shared online, are the ones in the position to archive and uh, investigate this material. And this is especially important now. Social media companies take this kind of content offline quite frequently. So the first challenge is grabbing this stuff before it gets deleted by the social media companies. Then it's actually you know, archiving it in a way that makes it searchable and usable and then investigating that evidence in a way that's um, useful for accountability processes. And we've done a lot of work on that already. We're hoping to expand it in the future. But it's one of those things that unless you're willing to take kind of massive amounts of government funding, um, it's very hard to fundraise around. And we're trying to avoid taking government funding because obviously that then opens you up to a different kind of criticism. So um, it's been something that's very, very, you know, even raising reasonable amounts of money for this, you know, two hundred thousand pounds, for example, is quite difficult because there just isn't the kind of donor uh, mindset outside of governments that are focused on actually collecting and uh, analyzing this kind of evidence and looking at how it can be used for accountability. Uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to 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 say that you know the obviously the level of government funding is different to what you can get from from crowdfunding, and from the audience that you're writing for, but uh, I think that we've seen that even though you stand in front of an army of government funded trolls, 
you still do pretty well. And, you know, the numbers that you provided in the book about the disinformation campaign after the MH17 and after after Scripple, after all the events that basically whenever you, you publish something, there appears hundreds of thousands of tweets of, you know, different versions that are contradictory. <laughs> But you still, you know, there's still this authority and people people listen. So is there any any trick to that, to building authority other than, you know, the transparency and sort of showing how you came up with, uh, you know, with the results of your investigations, you know, every step of the way? It's kind of easy to say, you know, just show you're working and people will believe you, but you need people to actually... Um, kind of look at you in the, you know, want to look at you in the first place. Because if you're writing 2,000 words on how you verified a video, most people aren't going <laughs> to want to spend the time doing that. So you kind of have to build a reputation, first of all, which can be a kind of trickier thing to do. Um, but a big part of it is, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that we approach this as evidence rather than just, you know, a story to be told using these images, I think is very important because we hear from many kind of big, you know, international bodies. I mean, I've, I'm working with the ICC on some stuff. We've been contacted by the UN and OECHR asking about our work on various topics. They see a lot of value in that. And more and more what we're finding is um, we get approached by these bodies, you know, saying, are, are you working on this? Are you working on that? Because we are, and you know, we don't have this kind of open source uh, you know, investigation capability that you have. And it does get a bit frustrating because then you kind of have to pick and choose you know, which topics you study. I mean, over the last several months, and we've had the situation with uh, Israel and Palestine again, we've had, uh, you know, the situation in Sudan and uh, the Ethiopian and Eritrean conflict that we did some work on, um, you know, more stuff in Cameroon. And each of those cases, whenever we write something about it, we're contacted by some big international body who are hoping that we're going to do more stuff on it because they find it so useful to have that extra information. And we're still a small organization. I mean, we have 23 full-time and part time staff members um and it, it it's we kind of have to pick our battles in a way and not just think about which investigations could possibly you know have the most influence or have the most impact in a certain kind of accountability area but what actually drives the entire kind of field of open source investigation and the use of open source uh, evidence in justice accountability forwards in combination with what's a, you know worthwhile thing to look into because you know there could be a dozen interesting you know investigations that could be done on you know terrible war crimes that could reveal about it but you know we might get to choose to we you know because of our resources just to do one of those so we have to be kind of very careful about which ones we choose both in the short term of what impact that can have and also in the long term and my hope is that as we grow as an organization i'm hoping that we'll eventually have enough staff members who are able to work on these kind of incidents that when a conflict kind of suddenly erupts somewhere in the world from day one we can be archiving the you know the videos coming from it understanding the kind of online landscape and the organizations on the ground doing the work and very quickly start um investigating these incidents and putting information about out them about them out very shortly after they've happened because at the moment it's more case that uh, conflict erupts and then you know you have to find some funding to get staff members to work on it and then you know in the kind of six months to a year it takes you to do that if you're lucky um the conflict is maybe over and then everyone's kind of moved on and no one wants to fund it anymore anyway so it, it becomes kind of this uh, we want to avoid this kind of chasing kind of around these things rather than just have people there ready to go from day one um and my hope is with that then if we can reveal that and you know show this stuff quickly then it will stop the worst atrocities of these conflicts from being from happening in the first place and actually put more international attention on what's happening in these places mm -hmm. uh, you know i, I think that just as the Vietnam War was the first war that was televised and, you know, so people could watch what was going on, like on live TV almost. I think that the war in Syria, well, maybe Libya, but Syria was bigger, was the first war that, you know, you could watch on the internet. And, you know, in the same way, you could see photos, you could see videos, you know, almost a few hours after they were taken and really exposing a lot of, well, things that you would not see even on live TV. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful for the future because I think that, well, you, you could see a pattern because you can watch the same thing happening with other wars, like with Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, or any other war that happened over the last few years. So, um, you know, I'm really, I have high, high hopes for the future. And I think that it's, well, might be easier to, you know, to seek the truth and expose, well, expose the truth. <laughs> 
But, uh, you know, slowly nearing the end, I wanted to ask you if you could give us a hint of what uh, Bellingcat Productions will be doing, the, the one that was founded <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, so I, I, we've just founded a production company. Um, our intention with that is to take some of the work that we've been doing um, and start turning it into documentaries, um, podcasts, um, you know, even kind of fictional kind of drama series inspired by the, our work and, you know, bring our work to a much broader audience. Because um, while we do get a lot of attention, I think we have got some stories that I think, you know, you, we could take to kind of a more Netflixy kind of HBO documentary style audience. So uh, our hope, and we'll hopefully have some progress on that in the next month or two, is we'll you know have a documentary or two sold to a big um, broadcaster. But the one documentary that we've made quite a bit of progress on um, is one on the Wagner Gate uh, scandal in Ukraine, which um, was basically there was a. Last year in Belarus, there were a group of Wagner mercenaries who were arrested by the local authorities who claimed that they were there to support the um, pro-democracy protesters. Um, what we've discovered is that was more, most likely um, a Ukrainian intelligence operation, and we've been working on a documentary about that and why it's failed. And that'll probably be the first thing that we're going to be releasing. We're really hoping it'll be done by the end of this month, although we've been <laughs> promising that for like the last four or five months. So I'm not saying we keep on getting more people turning up saying they you know, have more information on it. So it just we're, we're hoping it'll be very soon, though, because it'll be the kind of year anniversary of that happening. And we'd like to get that out soon. So, uh, yeah, that should be very interesting. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure you will be very busy with all the stuff that's happening now. The Pegasus scandal, uh, it's only unfolding, but maybe in the next few days we'll, we'll know some more. It's uh yeah it yeah it's it's sort of a, a a reverse situation you know comparing that to, to what you started with which was the the news international phone hacking scandal so you know it was the journalists spying on the politicians now it's the other way around <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh yeah more on more on that to come in the future um i, I wanted to to thank you very much for participating in, in in our podcast to to agreeing to talk with us and you know giving us all of that insight into into what you do as as Bellingcat. We are fascinated by your work and really inspired to, to sort of you know develop what we do. So um thank you thank you so much and uh, you know if there's anything that you w- would like to to say to 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 our audience maybe to recommend something or like a hint or how to be you know how to be more critical in what you find on the internet. Oh, hint. Um, I mean, my advice is actually just, you know, try, if you, you're interested in this stuff, just give it a go. Don't feel that, you know, you see Bellingcat doing all this big stuff from Russia and chemical weapons. It doesn't always have to be about something huge. I mean, recently I've been helping an organization in the UK that helps people recover their stolen dogs. And um, that we've already managed to get four dogs returned to their owners using, you know, just... Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> So it doesn't have to be a huge, you know, big thing. But yeah, just look for something you care about and, you know, try and find out more about it and think about the kind of techniques Balancat uses, which you can read on our website and think, oh, maybe I can give that a shot. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, we highly recommend the book. Uh, we are Bellingcat, an intelligence agency for the people. This, the, you know, all the new articles from Bellingcat, you know, you can check it out on bellingcat.com. You can follow Elliot and other members of the team on Twitter, on social media. Really great stuff. We are, you know, discussing that a lot in, in Demagogue. So, um, again, thank you so much for the, for the podcast. I'm sure that we will be publishing more on Bellingcat in the future. That's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Słuchaliście podcastu Demagoga realizowanego przez Soundsend Stories. Więcej informacji o nas i naszej pracy znajdziecie na stronie demagog.org.pl i w naszych mediach społecznościowych. Do usłyszenia!